Am I on? Hell oh, hi! Hello and greetings. Welcome to a brand new episode as well as uh, what it feels like and maybe therefore is a whole new season of this program, VGA Fireside. I am your host and the VGA Director of Exhibitions, Chaz Evans. Coming to you live from a cozy place that in fact has a fireplace in it, making the title of this show just a little bit more literal, even though there's no fire inside because that would burn the house down. We don't want that. But I've successfully moved out of my uh, unfinished basement. It was very cold and I'm here to keep things warm with a lively conversation uh, and questions with artists who make video games. Before we begin, as always, we have uh, many thank yous uh, to put out there into the world, and I'll start them now. We wanna thank producer and director of operations for VGA, Bryce Poles. We wanna thank the designer and director of communications, Eleanor Schichtel. We wanna thank the entire VGA staff and VGA board for the work keeping the organization running. And we want to thank the Independent Game Designers Association Chicago chapter. Thank you, Ross, for helping spread the word. Uh, student groups who have joined us in the past and perhaps are uh, joining us today, we want to uh, say hello to. Hello to the Media Arts and Game Design module uh, at Northwestern University. We want to thank uh, the DePaul Game Development uh, students. Uh, thanks to Caleb for helping spread the word. Uh, we want to thank Electric Mirrors for the intro music that you just enjoyed while waiting for me to appear on screen. And we wanna thank the Oldham Music Center Youth Brass Band for the fanfare you're about to hear in a little bit. Before we begin though, I want to, you to know that if, you, if there are any organizations or groups that would be interested in this kind of program where we talk live to people who make video games and tell their stories and the secrets behind their work, uh, please drop us a line at info at vgagallery.org. We would love to hear from you. Uh, and so, without any further ado, Bryce, please hit us with the opening fanfare. Yes! Fanfare is played, and therefore, VJ Fireside is officially in session. I missed that uh, after taking uh, last month off. Nothing like a VJ Fireside fanfare. Bef uh, so, the next point of order is to introduce our very special guest. The very first time we've had a double guest uh, right here on the program. Uh, let me please introduce them now. VJ uh, Gallery welcomes game designers. Did the game designer duo Melo Santani and Marina Kitaga of Analgesic Productions uh, for this episode of VJ Fireside. Melos and Marina are the minds behind such games as the Anodyne series and even the Ocean. And as solo artists, Melos uh, is the creator of All Our Asias, and Marina uh, coded the DIY blogging platform Zonelets.net. Everyone at home, please help me welcome Melo Santani and Marina Kitaka to VGA Fireside. Yay. Thank you, Chaz. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Greetings. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Uh, doing all right. Very hot. Very hot in Tokyo, too. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, I was in chat. You're joining us from Tokyo. <laughs> you're joining us from the Twin Cities. Uh, this, is it, the, this is perhaps the biggest benefit of, of doing things online is bringing us together from different points to go. Perhaps a theme that might come up. Oh yeah, maybe. Work <laughs> just a little while. Possible. Um, so again, thanks for taking some time to talk about your work. There are a lot of people uh, out there watching this program who are interested to uh, get involved with the field of video game making in many uh, different tiers. Uh, or context. So it's good to hear everyone's story about how they got started. So I'd like to ask each of you, how did you get involved with video game making? Let's see. I can go. Um, so me, I uh, played games growing up and then I did, I found like a cave story modding 
program like in before high school started. Do you remember what that, I did some programming? Do you remember what that cave story program was? I uh, I don't remember what it it was like some kind of edit level editor. Someone did to reverse engineer the game and you could like make really kind of janky levels. And then right. throughout high school, just some programming classes, um, Visual Basic and Java. And then in college, one summer, I was just very bored and joined an open source like game engine forum. And that was the beginning. Terrific. Is there yeah. anything you can add about that, 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 that group, that, that community, about how you found it and uh, sort of yeah, so where you were in life at that time? That was made by, it was, the engine was Flixel. It was in ActionScript 3. And if you know Adam Saltzman, who now works at Finji on Overland and stuff, um, he totally. was the one who made that engine. And yeah. it had a pretty active community for maybe a, like a couple of years um, before, I guess, fading out to like Game Maker and uh, a different version of the engine. Um, but it was just good because most people didn't really know how to make games. So everyone was just kind of like asking, how, how do I? make a spike tile or some basic game thing. And that was just good for like trying different things out. And then whenever there, there was a game jam, like uh, Ludum Dare, I always feel weird saying it that way. Uh, that was good because everyone would make their games and then you could talk and ask people, oh, how did you do this or how did you do that? So that was a good way to kind of build some programming design intuition. Yeah. Can I follow up? Is that because your instincts is to say Ludum Dare, but it's supposed to be Dare? Yeah, it's supposed to be Dare, but I don't know. It's like how often never... is it actually vocalized? Is it mostly just seen on a web page? It's mostly just seen. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you yeah. <laughs> you sort of doubt yourself every time you need to actually pronounce it. Oh uh, okay, God. so so a community that had a specific tool, and you know there were you know sort of. Uh, just kind of specific questions that, that got people talking to each other, as well as a game jam like Ludum Dare, uh, that that got things started for you. Uh, what was the, the next part of the story? Or maybe we could, if we were trying to take this like a screenwriter, take us up to the point where you meet Marina, and then we can like cut and maybe arrest back to the beginning. Uh, of the yeah, so I spent about a year kind of just making small games, game jam games, or just experiments during college. And then I made a kind of a long platformer called um, Inspiration Dave. You can look it up if you want. You can still play it on Newgrounds. Um, Maybe I will. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I got some like sponsorship money from some Flash Portal, if you remember that stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyways, after that, I started working on Anodyne by myself. And I was looking for pixel artists. And somehow, Marina and I had a mutual friend at her college. Um, and Marina's like, yeah, I want to do pixel art. And I was like, yeah, I can make a game. Here's an old game that I just did, Inspiration Dave. And yeah. Terrific. So that brings us to Marina. Would you mind also sharing your story? Uh, we could ratchet back to, to the beginning. Where do you feel uh, it is that, that got you started uh, working as a video game artist? Sure. Um, so I usually frame it as when I was young, I played video games and my older brother and I, like, you know, we'd get a new video game every once in a while, but we were like, oh, we really want to play more games. So when we got the internet, we were like searching the internet for free games to play. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time where that led us was like game developer communities making games. And those were the ones that were just like, free things that you could find and download. Um, and so the two major ones for me growing up were uh, the early game maker scene, uh, gamemakergames.com, I would always be checking. Um, and like Mark Overmars site, who was the original creator of Game Maker. Um, and then the other one was the OHR RPG CE, which was a... Um, RPG maker that was like originally like DOS based and had a pretty, I think it's a small but fairly vibrant community of people mm -hmm. uh, making, a lot of them were really like sort of weird or joke games, um, mm -hmm. but definitely like a lot of energy and a lot of people who 
really wanted to make grand projects. Um, what kind so, of aesthetic does the did this uh, DOS based RPG maker typically uh, <laughs> put out? Um, so it had, so it definitely looked kind of like old and DOS like. Um, it it was limited to like a two fifty six color palette, I think, mm -hmm. and then uh, within that you would have um, like sixteen color palettes for like character art. Um, or like enemy art in battles, um, and yeah, so so kind of chunky, low color, and like sort of an interesting palette that wasn't exactly like um, any specific console, but it it to me it reads very um, old computer game, very mm -hmm. like saturated colors. Mm -hmm. um, the original palette anyway. There's there's kind of a more nuanced one recently that has become the new standard palette. But the the OHR to me is a really interesting engine because uh, it doesn't really feel like it's like blown up in the way that Game Maker has from its like humble beginnings. Um, you know, a lot of people, only a few people are using it for like commercial games, although there are some. And but it has been in like continuous development like since I was a child. Just like slowly adding more and more features, so every once in a while I like check back in and get really excited about like, oh, you can do, you know, a custom border around your text box now. That's like <laughs> super exciting to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those were the two sort of hobbyist uh, developer communities that I would always be checking in on regularly, and I would like dabble, but usually I would just be too limited by the like number of different skills. So I would, I did a lot of like drawing and visual art as a kid. And so I would start a lot of projects where I would like make some sprites and, you know, kind of figure out the basics of coding, but really hit a wall when it came to a lot of the like more complex coding and then like level design. I just didn't really know where to start. So I have a lot of like tiny fragments of projects um, and a lot of like uh, sketchbooks where I would be writing ideas for games and stuff uh, growing up. And um, I'd like continued to do that basically throughout high school and throughout college, uh, create like little scraps of games um, and be following these different communities. And then, yeah, so that's kind of where it links up with Melis's story. Uh, when yeah. I was in college, um, this mutual friend put us in contact. And then I remember playing both Inspiration Dave, but also Melis had an early demo of Anodyne 1, which oh. was called Intra at the time. Oh. And uh, I immediately felt like pretty strongly about it because it had had a strong sense of atmosphere, even in this really rudimentary demo. And I was like, oh, this is exciting. I definitely want to be a part of it. True. So you have been working on games and uh, things that go into games for some time, uh, had not yet found uh, perhaps a, the, a long-term collaboration. Uh, you're both in college. Uh, there's a mutual friend. This is the initial catalyst. Actually, the one thing I do want to um, acknowledge from the story there is when you're very, uh, you know, just starting out trying to uh, find free games that, that that seeking that out online uh, brought you closer to the center of game production or two other game producers right like the hunting out free stuff gets you closer to people who are who acknowledge that this is something yeah. that needs to be made whereas if you're paying a lot of money for games perhaps one could infer that you're getting further away from games as something I think it's important to like have a well, it's very beneficial to have a childhood where you're playing these free games. I didn't mention, but like, I grew up pretty much as soon as I started playing games. You know, Newgrounds was really big. Armor games, Congregate, uh, like Mini Clip, if you remember that, and all these like free game flash portals puts you really close to like independently created stuff. Um, and then the indie games blog, like circa 2008, nine, and ten. That surfaced a lot of like good curated kind of indie games. Like I played a lot of stuff by um, Maddie Thorson, 
like mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the names, but like Jumper and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, indie games have been around for so long, and right, and it's yeah. it's this historical. I say this all the time. It's a truthism. It's just this, you know, somehow a spike of them makes them only exist in the 2010s. This is just not true. This is a long history that we're dealing with. Um, uh, so that's great. So everyone out there, remember, value your free games. You value them with other things other than money. Yep, 2010s uh, to... just when the venture capitalists came in. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's other ways to value things. And then uh, that starts with a long course. We were both interested in this field. Then you, you meet, so tell us. Uh, how does it go from there? How did your collaboration uh, and therefore uh, analgesic productions form? Uh, well, so Anodyne started as like a casual project. We were just doing it for fun. Uh, but <laughs> and I think after a few months, maybe after uh, Marina's art started coming in, I think we were both kind of like, oh, <laughs> we can sell this. Um, so we tried to do that. And uh, the really lucky thing was that just around then, um, we were still in college, so they have a lot of free time in college. Um, at least we did. Uh, Do you mind sharing which colleges those were, and if you were studying video games as a part of that college experience? That might yeah, be to some. I went to Chicago, but I only studied um, computer science, and then I took some music classes, but uh, that was more on the like computer side. I already had had like lots of music as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, and I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and um, I was an art major, and the art professors d didn't, they were just like, oh, sorry, I don't know how to talk about games. So, so that yeah. was definitely like kind of my uh, independent study. And then within the context of school, I was more focused on like drawing and printmaking and stuff like that. Right. But they, so they still let you work in that in, the, in games media, even if they had no experience it on their own, or to just um, sort of go spill over into your free time. It was mostly free time. One time, I made a little game for uh, the junior seminar class, which was just like not like a vague sort of class where we were mostly learning generally about being an artist. Um, but mostly it was in my free time. And then, yeah, working on Anodyne 1 was mostly on breaks. So like a summer break and a winter break for me. Right. The, obviously, these kinds of questions are also just selfish coming from me also as you know, a college-based educator trying to find out how much people actually, is it a part of their, their study that this is, you know, becomes a part of their life or is it all sort of a, uh, on the margins of it, and that still ends up becoming a profession. Both stories I hear very frequently. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, uh, you, you've you met, Anodyne is already uh, off and running. At that point, were, so were some pretty clear roles formed there from the beginning? Yeah, yeah the that interesting, was, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, the way, yeah, the way it kind of started was, was that Melis was just looking for a artist for the pixel art. And so I, I feel like it kind of morphed as we started having conversations about the game generally and just me trying to ask like uh, about what was going on with the decisions in order to like do the art well. But because I had been interested in game design uh, my whole life, I kind of inevitably had opinions and kind of started asking more questions and giving more suggestions and Melis always seemed to be really receptive to that and really open to making it more of like a collaboration. And so it kind of like shifted as we started talking to be more of like a even split because I ended up uh, suggesting like, oh, why don't we add more like dialogue and characters that you talk to? And then I did a lot of the writing for that um, so yeah, it kind of morphed as we worked on it to be the kind of roles that we roughly continued to have, although we mixed things up somewhat. Yeah, do you, do you have a way of describing what those roles are in, in the present day, or is it uh, a fluid melange of creative exchange? Uh, I would say they're pretty, well, coding and music are always the stuff I do. Marina always does the art mm -hmm. and um, usually the writing, but 
for our recent game, Stephanie, I led the writing. Um, there is, so usually with writing, there's like a lead person and then the other person will like write some other things, but they're not usually as core to the narrative experience. So like Anodyne 2, Anodyne, even the ocean were led by Marina, but then Stephanie was led by me. Um, and then for the game and level design, that's always a really like, very conversational thing. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. equally us, although, yeah, no, it's, it's like, I think it tends to be that I will like kind of rough out the levels with like debug art or something based on my and Marina's like paper ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and then Marina usually goes and polishes it and like, you know, makes it a little bit more interesting um, or gives feedback, although in the ocean, yeah, it, it it changes a lot from game to game, but it's a pretty like collaborative process. Yeah, so it, it ends up feeling like a, like, a, like as Maria just mentioned, a, a fairly even artistic partnership. There's some technical stuff that can be done uh, for, from one hand to another. Um, but on that topic of writing, this may be a little bit super, superficial or just talking semantics. Do you prefer the term writing or narrative design? Do you ever deal with that term, or is it just writing? Um, I mean, the those the term narrative design, I guess, suggests to me uh, kind of a different aspect of the creative process, which is definitely also a part of the game. Or I guess when I hear narrative design, I think uh, thinking about kind of the structure of how plot both rolls out and ties into kind of the game design and the structure mm -hmm. of the game as a whole. And then when I think writing, I think like putting the actual words together that someone will see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, uh, I think we're kind of using them to mean both kind of. Great. Yeah, narrative. Yeah, in the case of well, so I, I guess I can see like three distinct th things. There's like the plotting of a story, and then there's the more close to the game design part. So it's kind of like, oh, when when will cutscenes show up, or like how many people to talk to are here and here? What are their kind of tones based on where you are in the game? That's more of the I guess narrative design you could say. And then writing is kind of where you just sit down and have to like <laughs> make some prose. Do, do this for like three hours and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously there, there's overlap, but yeah, it, it is interesting how these terms lead us in different directions when you use them. Um, okay, so uh, the, the partnership is formed. There's uh, a, a string of exciting titles, the, both anodynes, uh, even the ocean. And um, now we're uh, on the cusp, maybe, maybe cusp, is, I don't know if that's the right term, but we're we're in progress for this this current project of yours called uh, Stephanie, and I wanted to know if you would uh, demonstrate uh, a live uh, current version of Stephanie for us here on the program. Yes, I can do that. Um, I was thinking <laughs> that maybe Marina can narrate a bit. Sure. While I'm, okay, that probably worked the best. It's just probably the best reason to have two guests, uh, so that one yeah. person can display and the other person can I will do now share my screen. Yeah, this will be audio. like um, like GDQ. Mm -hmm. Okay, Melos is about to attempt the double negative A press strategy. I play <laughs> it with my mind. Okay, um, it's Stephanie. So yeah, describe where we are uh, and what's happening. Yeah, we're kind of in this reddish hued, uh, big open cave area. This is one of the first um, layer, you kind of go down deeper into the layers of the cave as you progress through the game. And so this is one of the first layers of the cave that you get into. And there's kind of um, rocky spires and twisting shapes that Melos is currently jumping around on. And um, yeah, so one of the interesting things about this game is it's a 3D platformer 
And we really thought about a lot of different 3D platformers as we were designing the controls for this game and like what you do in it. And really wanted to add some like really interesting and unique ways of moving that kind of change the way that you think about space. So it's less about just, um, you know, moving towards a direction and jumping when you have to jump and more thinking about how the ways that you move create a language that lets you interpret the shapes in a way that is unique to this game. Um, and so some of the moves that you have to navigate are running on walls, which is very like inspired by um, the like Tony Hawk wall ride move. Classic, games. enjoyable. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, then we also have this uh, dash that kind of teleports you forward in the air a little. And if you do that into a wall, then you get like this sort of bouncing vault where you're able to go higher. And um, we thought, I think this is like a really cool move because the thing with 3D platformers is that depth perception is really tricky in um, 3D games. And so a lot of 3D platformers have to kind of contend with that in some sense. And one of the most straightforward ways of doing that is with like a double jump move. Um, because you're like, oh, you have to like undercorrect or overcorrect because you're trying to figure out what the depth cues are. Um, mm -hmm. And that definitely like works. It functions as like a game design, but it does kind of like flatten the space where you almost have too much control. And so the way that you approach most challenges ends up being like kind of the same. Um, and then another way of dealing with it is having like a ledge grab um, where, oh, I didn't jump far enough, but I'm grabbing onto the ledge, so I'll be OK. I'll climb up from the ledge. And so this is kind of like a ledge grab, but it's it allows kind of a wider range of things to happen where it's not like you're totally safe. You know, you, you still have to like make decisions about when to do the wall vault and you're still in control of your movement after that. So I think it's a really interesting a uh, set of moves for a 3D platformer. Yeah. Let me ask a sort of contextualizing question about that idea of movement is language. Language is, you know, a, a communication medium between two parties. Who do you, although those two, what, the second party could always be the self. Um, but yeah, who do you perceive um, if the player is, is learning the language of movement, uh, who, who is the other party being communicated with, with this new sort of encoded movement language? Yeah. Um, is it the system of the game? Or is yeah, it? Uh... I, think, I think it's like the level design kind of, um, or the game generally, uh, where we create certain ideas that are kind of like asking leading questions in the level design, and people can answer like with a leading question you can answer in the way that uh you think that the question asker wants you to answer mm -hmm. or you can answer in different ways and knock it off um, course yeah yeah here which, uh, there was a question from the audience i missed a little bit ago which is uh back to an earlier topic but uh someone did want to know how long did it take to make the first anodyne game um I worked alone for about three months from March to June 2012. And then most of the work was done over the next seven months. So from June to like January. So it took about like if you round up a year, but really like maybe three quarters of a year, which is kind of like shockingly fast the more I think about it. it I would say if of the titles discussed on this program, that it's one of the speedier timelines that we've addressed. But it, you know, there are all kinds of different games. Yeah, and all there's different a lot of like lucky reasons as to why that was the case, why it was so yeah. fast. Um, but uh, actually, going to that, people are interested. Oh well, it's kind of like it's stuff that we kind of lucked into almost. Is like the 
fact that it was tiled like pixel art makes things a lot faster and the top-down perspective limits kind of how much things can blow up and also the design language we borrowed from Zelda meant that we didn't have to like test out a lot of design ideas as much. A lot of those um, design ideas were resolved and also familiar to yeah. the audience. So it was more like, well, there's a lot of things we don't like about Zelda, so let's remove those things. And um, <laughs> that's a little bit easier of a process. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, it was it's just a very particular set of circumstances for me personally. Like, I was, I was like so excited to be working on a game that I felt like would be a completed project. Mm -hmm. um, after you know like spending my whole life wanting to do that uh and so i worked on it like kind of like feverishly in a way that i don't think i could like ever really work on a game again because it would just be like way too much work <laughs> right perhaps perhaps should not work in such a way ever again yeah but yeah. you know i was like young and excited and it worked for for that stretch of time kind of yeah uh, but yeah, uh, burnout and, and, uh, even, um, well, we put it, put it in a sort of negative context, exploitation of the self or other topics we've talked about on this program, but like keeping, keeping that balanced and healthy, um, when, if you don't quite have the bandwidth, but it's good that that, that did, um, work out in this, the case of Anodyne, but I guess I wanted to put the same quite now that that was one game, uh, nearly a, almost a decade ago, uh, and now we're working on this game. How does yeah. it compare as far as timeline is concerned and as far as like uh, the, the veracity of, of, of labor? Um, well, it's, there's a lot more work. I would say that this game is maybe three times as much work as Anodyne 1, but um, it was Corona, so that made things kind of hard and depressing <laughs> to work for a while. Yeah. Um, other things are pressing based on the state of the world. And also, we're just older, so I feel like I just work a little bit slower now. Um, but I think we're a lot more efficient than something like even the ocean. Like, we're pretty good about knowing when to, like, cut back and how to, like, preserve the core of what's important. Um, I would say, yeah, I'd say it's a pretty good development overall. I think maybe uh, the game is good itself, but maybe there was too much stuff in, too many different systems in the game. It takes a while to do. Uh, I think prototyping could have been a little bit faster. I feel like I learned a lot about like just prototyping from working on this um, and kind of like when to know that you're planning too many things without, oh, well, okay. It's, it'll be easier if I kind of like show this example. This is a good segue into the other main part of the game, which is, um, well, the linking part of it. Yeah, I would, did want to ask about character switching, how you were doing that in real time, but also how this sort of uh, plays out also conceptually in the game. Yeah, so uh, the so this game kind of has three elements to it. You know, the exploration that we were just talking about, um, the story narrative elements to it, and then this linking system that you're seeing right now. So the, uh, the gist of the story, oh, one of the gist of the story is that you're connecting with these creatures around the island, um, of the caves underneath this like uninhabited island. And you're using this like special technology to sort of like link with them. And that mm -hmm. kind of creates, um, well, anyway, it's a way to sort of study them as animals and creatures. And it takes place in this like very simple like puzzle game where you're just trying to create these large regions of one color mm -hmm. and then fill this bar at the very top which uh, it'll go up as I play species. Um, so you're both studying. I can talk more creatures. as I, it's hard to talk and play this. <laughs> you're yeah, studying the creatures but the also trying to bond with them? Yeah and so the idea is kind of that you're these uh, the, the main characters are three biologists um, who are sent to test out this kind of uh, futuristic implant technology called Onyx. Um, and that's what allows you to sort of psychically connect to these creatures as a way of kind of like understanding their biology and behaviors. Um, and so this like little puzzle game is like a metaphor for 
that kind of research process and kind of trying to understand and connect with a, an ecosystem or a species or whatever. Yeah, so and there, yeah. Oh. Then there's a kind of shift between, yeah, both studying and being a part of it, seeing your own place inside the system. Yeah, that is, um, and, and the game kind of like increasingly explores that as time goes on in terms of like asking questions about, uh, you know, the boundaries between things, um, uh, ecosystems and individuals and nations and all kinds of, any kind of container, like ask questions about those sorts of ideas. In the yeah. story, when, when, these, when you solve a puzzle like this and you've linked, is it in the, in the story always a benefit to the creature that you're engaging with? Like this it always heal them in some fashion? Uh, it doesn't heal them or, necessarily. It's more about um, your sense of maybe it understands you and you understand it a little bit um but it's not really strictly about changing the state of either of you beyond that kind of sense of understanding maybe yeah there's the there's like a big theme of kind of um sort of cross nation cross cultural understanding but it's kind of articulated through this kind of creature character like metaphor and if i can uh clear this um there's something <laughs> that might uh, uh i'm just like no i'm kind of spacing out so um that's okay too yeah so after after um you finish this is kind of like for lack of a better word like a boss like this is like a, a big creature at the that's sort of narratively important um and so when you link with this creature uh which is one of the key species um there's kind of like a cutscene where the characters um you kind of get inside the characters minds and um maybe learn about their paths and or just things about their psyche um, it's and... gonna cheat and win. <laughs> <You're> che <laughs> it's your game. It's, it's, it's like it's hard game. to like play this, and um, I made this look really hard, but you can actually finish this in like a minute. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyways, um, I just want to make a few notes about just the creation side of this. But when I was yeah. talking about prototyping. Um, this system, you know, it had like kind of like moves and HP and damage and stuff planned and, um, you know, a lot of planning and not a lot of coding with that. And I feel like I learned that, you know, there's a certain point you can feel where you should just try to design a few levels and then use that as like data without, and, you know, don't worry too much about setting up systems because you're probably not even going to need those systems that much, you know, like there's only like what 30 of these links in the game and um you know a whole system of like damage or resistances or something it won't really because you're in a small team you won't really have well the level design might not be able to explore that in an interesting way so it's usually okay to go more yeah and at, minimal, at the same time you know? if you if that's a sort of extra minutia on this feature is it really making is the point made more somehow or was the point already made without that extra system on top you know what i mean like yeah i think it's kind of like paring down into figuring out what the point of it is because early on like marina had an idea of like placing shapes and there are a lot of like kind of strict rules about how to place them and that led into like a design space where we were trying to apply like damage and moves um but eventually that the narrative side of the game, thinking about like, oh, this linking is more about like a connect mutual connection between the characters and the island. That led to kind of, okay, well, we can strip away these like strict rules and these like weird RPG numbers and just focus on like, can the level design of these linking levels uh, create an interesting kind of like tension between the player and the, the level itself? 
So like on the level I just played, you have to like place pieces on certain regions of the grid to open up another region of the grid, which you can use to kind of link faster. So um, in that way, like you have every linking level kind of has a certain personality to it in the sense that like maybe a section of a Mario level might have kind of a certain design idea to it. Um, yeah, so it started kind of complex and it pared down to something that's very interesting and quick to understand. And then what's happening now is kind of the narrative aspect is explaining what's happening with the linking. So one of like the early twists, I guess close your ears if you don't want to hear, um, <laughs> early on is that uh, there's kind of the supernatural presence to the entire cave system. And that character's relation to the trio of humans is this is hard to talk about while playing. Maybe I know there was an interesting comment that, that came through that uh, so there was a sort of thematic resonance between the languages movement uh, part of the game and uh, the communicating uh, with the ecosystem through language of Onyx. D different ways of, of communication, uh, borders being communicated across. The, the, these, the, uh, just recognition, there's some sort of resonances uh, across the game in this way. Yeah. So to, to, to the uh, several of the points you just made about uh, how much you had planned out ahead of time, there was a, a question from chat that I think was partially answered by that. Uh, but the question was, do you usually have an entire game thought out on paper uh, before starting development, uh, or does the development evolve over time? It sounds like from what we were talking about earlier, the answer is there's just a few chunks that are thought out ahead of time, and, and then you start to get, get to practical work. Yeah. yeah, I would say we don't really. Yeah. Well, yeah, we we do we do have a lot of conversations about like kind of what could happen, and then as we start with the things that we're more sure about, uh, the sort of things we're less sure about, one will become cl more clearly the way to go than another, or certain things. Uh, sometimes we'll just get like tired of working and be like, what should we cut? And then we kind of like figure out what the most vital things are and cut the things that are less vital or, but certainly things change um, as you... we're making them. Yeah, like I guess for this game, the plot, so I had an initial like plot after we discussed a bit and then we kind of, figured out the onyx linking, like a base, like working prototype of it. And then we worked on the movement system a bit. And then from when those two things were in place, the onyx linking and the movement system, that's enough to build a game without words on its own, right? And so from there, the plot went under, wait, wait, wait. Actually, I can't remember now. But I know at some point, um, we're going to help revise the entire plot. And then I wrote a draft, and then Marina helped revise that draft. Um, but I think that final revision was after linking and stuff was in. So I feel like there's just some decisions that are hard to make before you have kind of a sense of what the game is like to play. Yeah. So um, and then as you... Oh, yeah, I'll keep moving around. I think we're basically done. Done? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, also, if, if, <laughs> we don't need to, to, to tax your uh, game playing side of your mind also while yeah. uh, <laughs> trying to feel questions as we have been doing. You yeah. should only have to do that for so long. Um, so I guess to, to, to wrap up, though, I did, there's one question that uh, about the game uh, and themes within it that I wanted to, to sort of uh, touch on before we move on to some other. Uh, questions and if there are any other questions of the audience, please send them on over. Uh, we like we love the, uh, questions from the audience. But the for you know even from the trailer of Stephanie, we've got these three characters. You mentioned they're all biologists. Uh, and even in the trailer, they are from you know specific non-fictional locations across the globe. And the island of Stephanie, I believe, is a fictional island. <laughs> right. yes. I'm not wrong in assuming that. Um, and so it, the, the, the sort of, yeah, diegetic fiction, fiction world bringing together uh, a sort of diasporic uh, uh, group of people um, that are rooted in the nonfiction world is, is, 
it just it's very uh, upfront, like in the in the way the game is presented. And I sort of wanted to know more about that. Um, and if yeah, there is a, a sort of use of of the video games themselves, you know, as this uh, kind of phys physicalization or visualization of those connections that are are sometimes only felt. Yeah. Well, so the nice thing about games, well, at least what makes them unique from like writing a novel about something um, is that kind of the places, the settings you have in the game, um, the, uh, the player's like relationship to exploring those also kind of translates to how the words they read kind of filter through their brain um, in a way, this is a little bit too theoretical for this. Um, but as an example, uh, it's also spoilers, close your ears if you don't want to hear it. But later on in the game, so this is kind of the main spatial twist of the game is that uh, the back half of the game areas are very based on places from these trios' lives. So it's actually like, you know, um, a level based on like a city, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get there after you've kind of gone through a few of those like longer cutscenes you just saw at the end of the demo and gotten to know a little bit about the, the trio and like their, the situation they're in. Um, and so by the point you've reached that, you know, you're a little bit invested in the characters and now you're getting to see kind of the deeper uh, side and history to them. And seeing those kinds of words and those kinds of spaces, I think those are um, useful in how the ending and the kind of overall like um, topic of the plot plays out. So now that you've thought about these characters, you know, backstories and their relations to these places, you can kind of think about, oh, how are they approaching this sort of central uh, conflict that gets presented in the middle of the game? And feeds back into the sort of non-fiction part of what we're Yeah, so it's kind of like a, you have that like departure from reality and then it's like you get a little bit deeper into fantasy and then kind of emerge from that. Um, Pull back out of it. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I really appreciate letting us get, uh, get a look at Stephanie, uh, and that's the current project. Could I briefly ask about some solo projects that each of you have worked on in the past? I wanted to ask, I'll make this a combo question, and you can uh, answer in the order you prefer. But. Um, can you tell us about the experience of Melis, Can you tell us about the experience of making All Art Asia's, and if the experience of making that as, uh, as a solo game uh, informs the collaboration of Analgesic? Uh, and similarly, Marina, in your own work, say in the uh, Zonelets uh, DIY blogging platform, uh, does the philosophy and practice behind that also inform what you do with Melis? Yeah, maybe Marina can. Sure. Answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Zonelets. Um, I guess you should also just mention what Zonelets is for, for starters for those who are yeah. new to it. Uh, so it's a very, very kind of like scrappy DIY uh, blogging software, which is, it's almost just a, uh, like a template uh, for a person to make uh, a blog in HTML. And um, much of the work of Zonelets from my end was learn, figuring out how I wanted to present kind of this template. Because in, in a sense, it's like uh, the software doesn't do much. Like you do almost everything like kind of like from scratch. So it's very like has this like from scratch feeling. And so uh, I, I think it's fairly accessible uh, even to like non-web developers. Um, and so a lot of the work was creating interesting metaphors and in how I wrote about it um, to to convince people that it was in fact not like going to be like too scary to touch or whatever. <laughs> Tarsus thinks so for sure, as you just saw. <laughs> yeah, and to just like really encourage people to just like try something different and see how they feel about it and maybe like have some some sense of like, oh, like I kind of understand something different about how the internet works maybe. Um, and so zonelets, yeah, it's, it is, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of thought that goes into it. 
that you can read on the website zonelets.net. I'm kind of trying to like look at the time here. But um, in terms of how it ties into our collaborative work, I, yeah, I, I was, it's very much part of the same kind of mindset that I feel like is a lot of the value that we bring to the video game space and the kind of work that we do and the kind of values that we try to embody in our games, which are kind of, uh, just having certain priorities around um, focusing on what's really valuable that like two individuals can make and like really leaning into like the hyper specificity of our experiences as people and our skill sets um, rather than trying to match up with kind of like uh, what might be considered the most polished or the most professional or the most like popular um, kind of ways of working. Um, and so I feel like we, we try to embody that and try to like create our own context in which the work that we're doing feels whole and feels complete and not just like mm. a worse version of something else that is yeah. that, that exists yeah. that's better because it's higher budget or whatever um and it's a totally different sense of ownership for both the producer of the blogging platform or game as it were and and those using it than than say something made in a very large company in california uh, there's a, well, there's another great question from the audience, but I wanted to, uh, turn this, the, 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 that 50, 50 question back to, oh, yeah, uh, sure. um, well, all ages, uh, a few things, I guess, well, the main, the most obvious one is just that it was kind of testing out 3D coding, learning the basics, so learning camera system, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that of course made us more confident to make, uh, Anodyne 2. Um, it also informed maybe thoughts about visuals in 3D. So All Our Asia's doesn't have very good texturing or technical modeling work, but it has um, pretty good art direction and like just kind of set up visual setups um, that I did. So that got us thinking about, um, you know, what can you borrow from film or theater, other mediums, and um, in the hands of an actual visual artist, you know, what can we <laughs> what can we do? Um, and from the narrative side, uh, I guess my interest in kind of tying in together themes about history and um, sometimes Asia in particular, uh, that just kind of gave more confidence on the writing side for me. Um, even, yeah. So yeah, I guess it's just yeah, building skills. True. Yeah, so it's not just about putting the thing out, you're making sure you're sort of taking something away from the experience that you'll carry with you for yeah. future projects. So let's, we have a little time left. We And I think we could use it to uh, field some other terrific questions from our audience. Uh, first of all, someone asks, what are some influences both of you, both, you both carried into the making of Stephanie, uh, in particular, particular uh, Marina, I know you've mentioned reading, reading Sweetgrass before. That's the question asker, not me. Uh, and I noticed a lot of thematic resonances when playing the Ceph demo. So yeah, are there any connections to Braiding Sweet Grass you'd like to address or any other influences <laughs> leading up to Stephanie? I actually haven't read it. Um, I was, uh, I suggested it um, because it's um, another friend of ours was uh, asking for games about, I mean, for books that had to do with like kind of the land or geography in an interesting sense um, because they were exploring stuff like that in games and a lot of thought around games and geography is sort of very like colonial. Um, so yeah, but that was just from my general understanding of what Braiding Sweetgrass was and I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but um, that's very interesting. I should read it. Um, I should too. <laughs> I, I hear it's terrific. And my spouse is better. It's sitting in our room and I've not read it yet, but I, I've got to get around to that. It's on the list. But yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts off the top of your head, Melis, about uh, Stephanie influences? Influences uh, making Stephanie. Um, a lot of just like nonfiction reading about the history of like Taiwan and Japan and stuff like that. Uh, like, uh, lived experience, just thinking about a lot of 
different types of Asian people that I know and their like relations to their country and stuff like that. Um, uh, spatially, a lot of the thought I put into like games like Dark Souls or Anodyne 2, those kinds of things are big influences on how we approach like level design and deciding on what places that are going to go in the game. Um, Marina gave me some really good references for writing. Uh, shoot, the Amazon Worker book, what was that called? Um, oh, Marina froze. Uh, mm -hmm. Seasonal Associate. Anyways, it's a second person kind of narrative about someone working at Amazon and has a really interesting kind of second person tone. Um, and Maria suggested that, and it was useful for kind of figuring out the style of some aspects of Stephanie, uh, like kind of this way to shortcut to an emotional connection by using a lot of you and kind of some stream of consciousness, consciousness stuff. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more I could think of if we had more time, um, but maybe there's a few more questions. There's a little more time, and there's a couple more questions. Marina seems still is Marina still frozen to you, Melos? Yes, Marina's frozen. Okay. Well, hopefully, the carbonite will unfreeze, and we'll have Marina um, back. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess this is a related question, and maybe would tie into those um, influences. I guess it's when you're influenced, then you have output, and then you make new artistic choices. Uh, what are the sort of distinctly new things artistically that you're uh, trying to explore with Stephanie? Uh, not really tried in the earlier projects that it's like, to, this is the time we have to try this out, Stephanie. I guess I'm more, oh, who just texted me? Oh, Marina's internet died. No, that's terrible, too bad. We had a really great question from the audience. That I was very much looking forward to asking. Uh, I'll, I'll text her for that one. Hold on. Um, what's yeah. the answer to? How did you become the queen of puns? To queen of puns. Let's see if she. We'll get that. Um, Thank you. New, art <laughs> new artistic things. Oh, that's something I would have to think about too. Because uh, there's a different. There's every single aspect of the game. You know, has a kind of an answer for that. Oh, Marina's back. Okay. My um, internet just zonked out for a second. Did you get the specific the question specifically uh, directed to you through text, or should I ask it again? <laughs> uh, wait, which th question? Oh, You're queen of puns. Uh, How did you become the queen of puns, Marina? Uh, the audience I, wants to know. I kind of feel like I mean I just like puns. I I I, I like jokes and um. But part of it was definitely, I feel like I was really sheltered. And so when I went to high school and I wanted to like join in on conversations, but I had no context for anything. So I would just make puns and it, would, it could be a joke about what was happening, even though I didn't know what anyone was talking about. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how you win friends and influence people. <laughs> yeah. Just a series of puns. puns. Yeah. I'm learn puns one day, but. Um... I think you perhaps yeah. have a competition, a pun competition with super producer Bryce, I know is also a, a, a pun smith of sorts. Uh, um, should we answer the, the artistic question or wrap sure. it up? Yeah, let's, let's, I mean, I have time so I can, I don't know. It's up to we, you. Can, we can push a little bit. Yeah, right. let's, 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 let's definitely address that. What were the sort of new artistic goals that you're trying to explore for the project and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I think there's, uh, I mean, one one thing is that it's it feels like there's more engagement with specifics of like the real world in terms of the characters being from real places and uh, talking about kind of naturalistic human life stuff. Um, and yeah, I think it's it can be hard to um, do that in a game that also feels like mechanically very like gamey and abstracted. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that is kind of like this interesting thing that we had to navigate in. And like, like the question earlier about the, the real experiences meeting in this like fantastical place, which allowed us to have this like gamey experience uh, and then go to sort of grounded places in, in the narrative, like dream sequences or flashbacks kind of. 
Yeah, I guess we've been able to explore, yeah, thinking, thinking ways that you can relate elements of reality into kind of a fictional universe. Um, I'm not sure if we're gonna do this type of like nonfiction fiction meeting again soon, but it's like, you know, a lot of new challenges. It was a very kind of complex tying everything together, but I think it works in the end. Yeah, and as all games often uh, put themselves in the, the costume of being this sort of hermetically sealed chamber and they never are, right? They spill over into our our everyday lives in so so many ways so that if that's actually addressed uh, in the content of the game, they make them somehow more honest. So I think it's a yeah. <laughs> terrific direction uh, that makes the, the project as thematically rich as it is aesthetically beautiful. And I'm so glad that you got to uh, share it with us, play with us and talk about it uh, with the audience today and uh, myself and everyone on the stream, I'm sure can't wait to play it. Uh, and we're, we can anticipate being able to do so when? Later this year, mm. hopefully. Later this year, perhaps? This, yeah, I'm really like, we've been saying Q4. I mean, it's kind of like, there's just a lot of miscellaneous stuff and testing left. So it's hard to like put a good time on that. Yeah. And really, you you want to do it right, not, not necessarily fast, right? Oh, um, I would rather do it fast. I fast, I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. Don't yeah. Listen to me then. Um, so anyway, that, that dovetails nicely into how we like to finish the show, which is a simple law of the internet. We have been talking on the internet, which means we need to finish by plugging things. What would you both like to plug? I guess we just plugged Stephanie. Anything else? Yeah, Stephanie will be really fun. And aside yeah. from that, uh, I mean, that's the main thing in my yeah, opinion. <laughs> if you're interested in the game, you can add it to your list for of wishes on Steam. Um, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> list um, of wishes. And, and you can check out zonelets.net uh, uh, if you're interested in that conversation or in having a blog. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, write about stuff. Write about your breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to plug. Plug writing. Yeah. Plug Mel writing. Melis has a great uh, Zonelets blog. What is your blog? Uh, I'll post the link in chat. If Bryce is there, if we could flash the Zonelets um, uh, URL, I think maybe Bryce also had a power outage problem. There was a huge thunderstorm while we were talking in um, here where I am as well, and I didn't know yeah, if that I'll pop into Twitch and post it in the chat. There, there. we go. Yeah. We got. And then okay. my blog is marinakitaka.com. And my blog uh, has a lot of stuff related, posts related to stuff that we talked about here. Um, I haven't written on it lately because I'm just tired and focusing on different things in life right now, but I'm sure, sure I'll get back to writing when I have some ideas. Terrific. So yes, please check out oh, this blog. Melissa's blog actually, but yeah. There's, there's writing to enjoy in addition to video games. Uh, there's some of the writings about games, sometimes about other things. Get out there and read some writing. <laughs> Shout out to writing. That's what we're doing, plugging here uh, on the program today. So from the VGA side, uh, I will, so yeah, this, so this series of, of interviews and discussions is brought to you by VGA Gallery. We're a non-for-profit organization hubbed out of Chicago. We try to support artists who make games. If you like this kind of program and like to support it, please uh, check out the website, vgagallery.org. You could buy, purchase a print. We sell fine art prints uh, that are images uh, about or taken from uh, artists made video games. Uh, and you could also just uh, give money directly if you don't want a print, that's fine with us too. Um, so uh, let's, uh, I'm gonna get my notes back. So I can follow the true path of gratitude uh, and keep thanking people. There we go. We wanna thank producer and director of operations, Bryce Poles, the director of communications and designer, uh, Eleanor Schichtel. We wanna thank the VJ staff and VGA board. We wanna thank the Independent Game De Designers Association Chicago chapter, thank you, Ross. Thanks to the Media Arts and Game Design Module at Northwestern and the DePaul Game Development Program. Uh, thanks to Caleb. The intro music by Electric Mirrors, the fanfare by Oldham Music Center Youth Brass Band. 
Uh, if you know organi an organization or group that would be interested in this program or have any feedback whatsoever, please drop us a line at info at vgagallery.org. We'd love to hear from you. Please join us next month when our very special guest will be game artist and scholar Kara Stone. Ooh. Do we have a, yeah. We even have a graphic to share with you on made before at the end of this episode. So yeah, please, that will be the, the last Wednesday in August. Join us uh, at the same YouTube or Twitch that you're enjoying right now for uh, a, a conversation with Kara Stone. Uh, anything else uh, just to, to add there at the end of, before we before we, we head home, Melissa Marina? Thanks for coming. Stay Thanks hydrated. For all the questions. That was a good chat. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. The audience, thanks so much to you, Marina and Melis, for taking the time thank you. to hang out with us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Very much appreciate it. And uh, thank you for joining us. And from all of us at VGA Fireside, please stay warm. That's the program.